Okay, so thank you for joining us. Um, I think two out of the three people on this call uh, were with us last quarter and the quarter before that. And so some of what I'm going to say is going to be a review for you guys. Um, I spent a lot of time looking over the material I ha I've developed and that we have available. And I decided to kind of reorder things a little bit. One, because I don't think it was super clear um, last round. And two, um, we're doing a little bit of a broader scope, I think, than either one of the last quarters. And so the pace is going to be a little bit different. Um, so I'm reordering the content a little bit. And I think it's going to be a lot more clear as we go through it. So today, we're just we're covering the baseline of the kind of circuits we're going to be dealing with in this class. And so um, we're going to be purely uh, purely drawing on paper. We're not getting into AutoCAD. That's for Wednesday. Um, but we're just going to talk about the baseline knowledge that we need to move forward um, for PLC-based control systems. So um, hopefully all of you know really the reason why we're doing this class to begin with, which is um, although the, we get a lot of high level um, presentation of theory and, and fundamental um, scientific principles behind what we're doing in our major. We don't get a lot of hands on um, practical experience in terms of lab for control systems and hardware and especially on the circuit side. Um, so circuits is an elective for us at Davis um, and very few people I've talked to in our major have actually taken it. And so to me, that's that's a little bit of a problem because um, when you get into a lot of process engineering, it's really important to understand how the circuits behind instrumentation um, and the hardware that we're designing on a, like in a modular design in process engineering, how all the fundamental circuitry under that works. Um, and so that's really the purpose of this class is to get our get our hands dirty with that a little bit, play around with it in a lab setting. Um, obviously this quarter that's gonna be 100% virtual um, for everybody but myself, but uh, at least it'll be some good exposure and I think it'll be a good learning opportunity. Um, so those of you that have taken a class with Dr. Cool may have heard her talk about um, chemical engineers being called universal engineers. Um, because they need to know a decent amount about mechanical and electrical engineering um, as well because really a lot of the process engineering design you do is taking lab scale chemistry you know where some somebody can just run up grab a beaker dump it and and do material transfer and different unit operations by hand right in a lab scale whereas on an industrial scale you can't just pick up a thousand liter reactor. And so um, you have to start applying different mechanical and electrical systems to actually get the chemistry to work in, a, in that kind of production scale. Um, so anybody who signed up for this class thinking all we were gonna do is just draw stuff in AutoCAD, um, sorry if I misled you, but uh, I think it'll be a valuable learning experience and I think you should stick around uh, because I think one of the one of the big values of trying to approach it in this standpoint is I think you'll actually get better at AutoCAD than you would if you were just learning AutoCAD operations in a vacuum. Um, at least for me, I'm a very kinesthetic learner, and so as I'm applying uh, principles that I'm learning in a certain area, uh, that's the fastest way for me to develop um, in a new tool like AutoCAD. I'll, I'll just get good using that tool faster um, that way than I would if you were just to have a dedicated class where you're just trying to teach me how to use a tool. Um, so one of the reasons we're focusing on circuits and drawing circuits is that's where my knowledge base is. Um, I, I feel most comfortable talking about circuits um, and PLC design rather than like mechanical system design. Um, I just think I'm more competent in those areas. Um, and so your drawings are really only as good as what you know. Um, and so I think I can help guide uh, the quality a little bit better that way. Um, and I think, well, I already said, I think circuits is one of the most underemphasized areas in our curriculum. Um, so I mentioned this briefly earlier, uh, circuits, the principles and circuits are really fundamental in knowing both um, 
how instrumentation functions and how to actually install it um, in, in a way that it's gonna function properly. Um, and so for chemical engineering and process design, you're, you're designing um, systems that are gonna have like tons of pressure and temperature sensors, flow meters, um, control valves, all that kind of stuff. And, and all of those have you know, fundamental physical principles underlying their operation, um, which we learn, I think, to a pretty good degree in our major. But then there's just the practical concerns of how that circuitry works and how you install it. And so that's what we're gonna focus on here. Um, and there's practical design considerations like you know, how far can you run a wire and still trust the accuracy of that signal um, coming from that instrument across those wires. Um, the other thing we're gonna look at is power distribution. Um, so this is gonna, this is all going to be what's you know considered low voltage, um, so not like long distance power transfer, but power distribution in um, like process engineering for running the pumps, powering up all your controls, powering your valves, um, all of that stuff. You have to actually break out your power correctly and make sure everything's getting what it needs and everything's safe um, and controllable. So what we're going to cover today is going to be basic circuit components, how to draw them, um, a little bit about what they are. Um, so that's going to be power sources, resistors, switches, lights, buttons. Um, we're going to talk about uh, different voltage standards um, as well as transformers for transforming between voltages. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about parallel circuits and how that's, you know, understanding how that works is important. Um, in what we're going to be drawing in the future. Um, we're going to talk about relays, uh, which are one of the most fundamental uh, control circuit components. Um, I think it's really important that people kind of understand the power of what, what you can do with the relay um, and how it works, as well as uh, that's a building block for understanding some of the more sophisticated modern control um, hardware that was sort of born out of out of complicated relays. So um, I think you'll get get what I'm saying a little bit more as we get into it. Um, and then I'm also gonna be drawing uh, most of these circuits by hand today, and then we'll be drawing them in AutoCAD in the future. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch over to the overhead cam. Um, can you guys see my hand and my mouse okay? Yep. Okay. Is there a weird little gray box blocking out? It, it'd be in like the uh, Yeah, it's in right, the top right. Here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to avoid that, but everything else is clear. There's no weird gray boxes anywhere else in here? Yeah, everything is okay. clear. Nice hands, dude. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Be a hand model. I'll stay. Okay. What's that? All state. All state hand model. Jeez Louise. I used to, well, I'll tell you guys later off air. Um, don't read into that too much. Okay, so um, in drawing circuits, um, any electrical circuit needs a driving force, right? A driving voltage um, that actually energizes that circuit. And so that uh, traditionally, uh, at least a DC power source is drawn like this. So this can represent a battery or um, I guess even a generator, any, anything that creates a voltage, right? And so you have that voltage of potential across this gap. So this is your positive, uh, let's see if I can get this right, positive cathode, uh, negative anode. And so um, you have these lead wires coming off of this power source. And then for any electrical circuit, you want a way to interrupt that circuit um, and, and break the circuit. And so uh, the most simple kind of way to do that is, is a switch, okay? And so this represents a switch. And these, these dots on, on either end of this, um, dots just represent a connection point. And so this switch is currently shown in the open position. 
and the switch will be actuated by something. Um, in this case, let's just pretend that it's a human. Um, so this represents a physical switch, like a light switch that somebody can go and flip on or flip off, right? And these represent physical wiring connections on either side of that switch. And so then uh, the other thing that um, you need for, for, a, for a current to flow through a circuit, I got a question here in the chat. Okay, um, they told me to disregard that. So in this circuit, you need what's called, you need a resistor. Um, and so a, a resistor can be really any type of component in your circuit. This symbol, this resistor symbol, just represents that there's a resistance to current flow um, or to uh, electron flow, and therefore this is gonna induce a current in your circuit. Uh, because of this potential. And so uh, if I if I go ahead and close the circuit, right, so now that's that's fully closed. Um, traditionally, uh, we think of electricity flowing or electrical current flowing from the positive uh, cathode to the negative anode like that. And so um, this this represents current flow. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there before I ever confuse this because I'm not an electrical engineer and I will probably lead you astray if I try to get too detailed with that. Okay, so let's talk about resistors for a minute. So this is probably, this may, in these uh, lecture series, this is probably the last time you'll see this resistor symbol um, because we're not really designing like circuit board circuits. We're designing, um, the next level up from that where you have modules that have circuit boards inside of them and you have connection points on those modules and we're wiring all those modules together to make them do something, right? And so really um, there's very few cases where you're gonna actually add a resistor into your, into your physical circuit in this setting. And so really the only application I can think for that would be for an LED. Um, so let's just go like this. Okay, so an LED is drawn like this. And so this is this is the symbol for a diode, right? Um, an LED is a light emitting diode. And so the way you show that it's an LED and not just an actual diode in the circuit um, is you draw little arrow, little up arrows, right? And you're just showing it's emitting it's emitting light. Um, another quick aside: a, a diode is like a uh, it's like a voltage check valve. So when you draw it like this, uh, current can flow. Sorry, current check valve. So in a diode, current can flow this direction, but not this direction. Um, and there's actually been one application where I, we actually had to add diodes into a circuit. And I'm gonna cover that later once we get a little bit um, more experience with talking about this, but it's just an interesting aside. Um, diodes are super cool. So um, so this, in in this case, if just as a, uh, just as a heads up, if you're getting some LEDs out of a, out of a hobby kit or something, and you want to wire that up to like a battery um, to light up that LED, you're actually going to need to add a resistor um, in series in that circuit. And um, I believe it can be before or after the LED. It doesn't really matter, but um, LEDs themselves don't actually uh, give enough resistance to induce a high enough current to actually light them up. Um, now. That being said, I'm sure you can buy LEDs that have a built-in resistor and you don't have to worry about that, but um, that's something that, that tripped me up before um, in, in the past and was super embarrassing. So just keep that in mind. Okay, um, so lights are, lights are a good example of a resistor that we might have. So you could draw a light like this. Um, you can draw it as an LED. Um, you can draw it as an actual light bulb if you want. Um, but that's a that's a component. Um, you can you can draw the color in there. That's a component we're going to use fairly fairly commonly. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to our next circuit component here, which is uh, the switch. So there's a lot of different kinds of switches. Um, there's I'm going to cover four of them really quick. So that kind of switch 
is just, it has a wire on each side of it. Um, and so this is called a single pull, um, single throw. And so this first, this single throw, uh, single pull just means that there's only two connection points. And so when you close this switch, it's either open or close, right? And then single throw just means um, uh, that there's only, sorry, uh, that, there, that there's only one thing being closed when you, um, when you close the switch. Okay, so the next one is, uh, oops, do that correctly. So the next one is a double pull single throw. Um, and so what this is you have this one incoming wire that can go to either one of these two wires. And so when you flip this switch, um, it'll move from this position and create contact at this position. And so with this type of switch, one of these wires is always energized, right? Or not energized, but one of these wires is always connected, right? One or the other. Um, and we'll go into, we'll talk about the types of circuits you could use uh, use that for in a second. Um, so the next one would be um, a single, uh, let's see, single pull double throw. And so what that means is these are single pull switches, but there's two of them. And so when I, this, this whole mechanism is attached to one physical switch, like a light switch. And so when I flip that switch, both of these connections change state. They both open or they both close. And so that's where the double throw comes in, right? As opposed to a single throw. And then you would have um, double pull, double throw. And so these are, um, I mean, really these, these two are just adding in more connections that are controlled on the same switch um, as compared to these, but these are, these are kind of like your fundamental switch types. And so you might be thinking like, okay, why, what's, what's the point of this type of switch versus this type of switch? Well, um, let's say you have a battery and think about this real quick as I draw it. And I have a double pull single throw switch. Well, I can run these two circuits here. Like this. And so depending on the position of my switch, either this is gonna light up or this is gonna light up, right? And so this circuit right here um, is basically a run indicator circuit. So if this one is red up here and this one is green, when my, uh, when my switch um, that controls a machine is in the off position, this red light would light up, right? And when it's in the on position, this green light would light up. Light up. Right, or if you were, uh, if this were like a safety system, it would be the opposite, right? Red means dangerous. So that's an application for a double pull single single throw switch. Um, and so this this is a standalone circuit, but this switch might physically also actuate. Um, here, let's see. So that's that's an imaginary connection to an uh, SPST switch. And so this might control the actual run status, right? And these might be physically connected. And so this would be a combination switch of both. Uh, so it'd be like a, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the abbreviation would be, but you get the idea of like, you can have multiple different um, operational switch types physically all ganged together um, so that they're all actuated at the same time. 
um, by the same physical operation from a human. Um, so moving on from switches, uh, we have we have a similar type component. Uh, anybody want to chime in and and take a stab at what this one might be? It's a button. It's a button. And what type of button is this button? That's uh, right. It's a normally open button. So that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't. I didn't talk about. Jeez, Louise, it's falling apart over here. All right. So I didn't talk about this yet, but this is a normally open switch, right? And so the implication here is that there's a spring somewhere in the system that basically pushes this open, right? And then the the uh, analog to this or not the analog, but the conversely, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is here. The other type of switch like this is a normally closed switch that has a spring pushing it closed. And so all this means is like basically um, your operator comes in here and they push this button and it closes the circuit and electricity can flow across this junction, right? Here, this is normally closed. And so the circuit is normally closed and your operator comes up and they push the button and it opens this up and interrupts the circuit. Um, so this is an important concept, normally open, normally closed, because when you start getting into virtual, uh, virtualized controls, um, you're gonna set things normally open and normally closed. And if you set them normally closed and it's an alarm and it's a buzzer and it's constantly going off, John's gonna yell at you. So keep that in mind, it'll be important later. Okay, so, I think the next thing we're going to move into is voltage standards. Section that off here. Okay. So, um, anybody in the call, do you know? A cool button. <laughs> um, do you know what the voltage coming out of your wall is? Like when you plug something into a wall socket in the US of A. One twenty. One twenty. That's right. So it's one twenty volts AC current uh, or alternating current, current, um, and it's at sixty hertz. That's the frequency, and it's single phase. So this is the voltage potential. Um, this is means that your voltage is coming in as a sine wave. So your, uh, your potential is, is alternating. Um, this is the frequency that it's alternating at. And so the frequency is basically, if I'm taking, oh, well, the frequency uh, sets the period of these oscillations, right? So the units, the, hertz, the units hertz are one over seconds. And so if it's 60 hertz, if I basically, and, I'm a, and if I'm an observer, on your circuit right at this point, 60 of these humps are gonna pass by this point every second. And then single phase means um, that you have one live wire. So for 120 AC single phase, incoming you're gonna have a live wire, you're gonna have a neutral wire, and then you, um, in modern day you're gonna have a ground wire. Um, so that ground wire is that third, that bottom lug, on the plug. Um, let me pull this out, show you. <clears throat> so, oof, I'm gonna screwed up my lighting. Okay, so on this plug, this is the ground lug, right? Um, and if you pull this off and use a tool, the health and safety guy comes and yells at you and kicks you off site. And then one of these is the live, uh, live stud, and one of them is the ground, uh, neutral stud. And on some plugs, one of these is bigger and there's a NEMA standard for which one is the live and which one is the ground. You can Google that. I'm not gonna tell you because I'll probably screw it up and then somebody will yell at me. Um, okay, so that's what's coming out of the wall. Now in control circuits, um, commonly you're gonna use 24 volts DC direct current. Um, and for us, that's what all of our 
control hardware that was donated to us. Um, it's pretty much all 24 volts DC. Um, and so to uh, other common DC voltages you'll see in a control setting are 48 and 12, every once in a while, maybe six. Um, most cars operate on 12 volts DC um, nominally, uh, or actually maybe it's, it's, I think it's close to like 14. But uh, a lot of the old, really old cars are actually six volts. Um, so if you're into old school hot riding, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then really briefly, I just want to mention um, in motor circuits, you can have, uh, you know, well, and, and some other circuits, you can have 208, 220, or 480. DC, um, this is three phase. Uh, these are usually called um, single phase, um, but really uh, a lot of times you'll have like uh, on 220, I think you have two live wires um, and a neutral. I don't remember exactly. Um, I'll look that up and cover it later. Um, but a lot of times you'll actually be modulating the frequency of these voltages um, because this is often commonly used, uh, all of these are commonly used for motor control. And so um, by changing the frequency of those AC pul pulses, you can actually control the speed that the motor spins. And we'll get into that more later. Um, I just wanna throw that out there so it's in the back of your mind. Um, now, We've talked about, okay, there are these different voltages, but this is the one that we get out of the wall. Um, and this is the one that we need to power our controller and all our inputs and outputs and all our, all our other modules. And again, don't worry, we'll talk about in great gory detail what all those things are later. Um, so how do we get this? How do we get 24 volts? Well, if you have something and you want it in a different form, you have to transform it with a transformer. So the symbol for a transformer is gonna be this induction coil and then some parallel lines and some stuff in between. I think that stands for like insulating oil. And then another uh, induced coil on the other side. And so this coming in here is some current, right, at some voltage. And this on the other side here um, is the induced current um, that's at a new voltage. And so physically what's happening here is you have a wire coming in and it's coiling many, 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 many times. Let's say like 600 loops. And then um, over here, you have incoming another wire. Um, and then in this plane here, um, so perpendicular, it's coiling in many, 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 many loops. Um, that's a different number of loops and then going back out. And so when you run current through here, um, it produces an electromagnetic field and induces a current in this coil here. Um, and that's going to be at a different voltage. And that voltage is determined by the voltage here and the ratio of the number of coils here and the number of coils here. Um, so hopefully you learned that in physics. Um, I probably didn't even need to cover that to be honest, because really all we care about is I can take 120 volts AC and put it through a coil like this and some other complicated circuitry and get out 24 volt, 24, 24 volts DC. So, um, I'm sure any competent electrical engineer is going to flay me alive um, if this goes online and they get a hold of it. But um, voltage transformation is hugely important. Um, you can get off the shelf modules that do this um, with a very, very low power loss. Um, they're super efficient, above 99% efficiency, um, which is really nice because um, if you don't do this correctly, it can be very energy intensive and um, you wind up sinking a lot of cost in electricity just to get the voltage you need. So, okay, so we've covered voltage, we've covered uh, AC, DC. Okay, 
So the next thing I want to talk about, the next circuit component we're going to talk about is relays. And this is the super cool Mac Daddy component. So what a relay is, is an induction coil. Ignore everything over there. So a relay is an induction coil. You have a current going through here. And as we said before, um, an induction coil will create um, electromagnetic field, right? And so on the other side of this, you'll have a wire coming in, you'll have a connection point, and you'll have a physical armature with a little strike contactor and a magnet. And then a wire going out on the other side of this, and this is attached to a spring that keeps it pulled back. And so what happens is when you run current through this, it creates a magnetic field and it physically pulls this closed and closes this connection, right? So this is really just a switch. Um, and, and then you can have, you know, whatever, whatever circuit you have, current will flow on the circuit as long as this circuit is active right, because it's pulling that in and closing that connection. And so you might be saying to yourself, why, why is this important? Why can't you just use a physical, you know, um, an actuated switch here that, that some operator goes and pushes? Well, the super important thing here is there's no um, electrical or physical connection between these two sides of the circuit. And so all I have to do is um, run whatever, uh, and so, uh, sorry, let me back up real quick. So you can buy these in whatever configuration. And um, when you buy it from the manufacturer, it'll be specified like what you need to run on this side, um, be it 120 AC or 24 DC. Um, and then it'll be specified what you, what you are allowed to run on this side. And a lot of times, um, you have more flexibility on what um, what voltage configuration you can run on this side. But this side is going to be, hey, you need to run 120 AC through this or it's not going to operate, right? So the beauty of this is I can use, actually, let's say I can use 24 volts DC on this side, right? Which again, I mentioned is our common control voltage, right? It's what we're going to have available as an output from our controller. And then on this side, I can have 120 volts AC. And so this, we can say, um, this is gonna be a really low current, like a quarter of an amp, right? Super low, low voltage, super safe, right? And then on this side, this could be 20, 30 amps of current at 120 volts, right? That's enough to kill somebody. Um, and so the advantage of doing this, or one of the advantages of doing this is I can have my switch over here that my operator touches, right? And let's say our operator's name is Bob. So Bob can come in here and he can close the switch. And if he slips and jams his finger in there or something, it's not a finger safe switch, Bob's gonna get shot. And at 24 volts and a quarter of an amp, Bob is gonna go home just fine, right? He's gonna get written up by health and safety. Um, and he's probably going to be a little scared, but he's honestly, you're not even really going to feel that, right? We've all probably licked the nine volt battery. Don't do that. I'm just saying if you have, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So on this side of the circuit though, if this is exposed and Bob were to slip and stick his finger in there, Bob's probably not going home that day. Right. And so what you can do is you can actually add physical barriers, um, on, and actually you'd really, so all, all this relay stuff is a little box, right? It's a little plastic box. So I can run wires to this plastic box on this side and have this switch way far away over here, away from all the dangerous moving parts and all the high voltage and all the, all the current that can uh, do nasty stuff to people, right? And protect my operator from um, all this stuff over here. Um, with physical barriers. Ooh, are you guys getting 
aberrations on the video. Yeah. Yeah. Dingus. Okay, give me one second. I got to reset the camera. <laughs> Super annoying, dude. I don't know why it keeps doing this. It like resets. Um, It resets the field of vision. I think I'm using a GoPro and I think it's just timing out. Um, so I need to go check the settings on that, but we're not gonna do that right now. Okay, so that's a relay. Like I said, you can get these for all different kinds of voltage configurations, right? This is basically just a, a single, single throw switch. Um, we actually have some that are, uh, that have two double throw switches, so what I showed you earlier, where you got this kind of configuration, right? And so this is this is the side that's being controlled, right, by the relay. And then you're also going to have your actual control circuit. So this type of relay actually has eight connection points, right? And if you want, you can just use this side. And if you want, you could even just use these two connection points, and then you have two connection points for your control wire, right? Or you can connect a bunch more circuitry to this and have, uh, you can actually start to get kind of like a sophisticated control circuit going with just this one relay box, right? And you can control uh, another voltage other than whatever your control voltage is. So um, in, in ye olden days, um, automated systems used a lot of relays. Um, in in control in conjunction with some other um some other things like uh like timing drums and uh and what have you and so these are actually like i said this is actually a physical switch it's a physical electromechanical switch and so um when you start if you have if you can imagine if you had like a room full of relays controlling a system um one of the problems is timing because um, these things actually, oh man, are you kidding me? Okay, hopefully it's going to be happy there and we're just going to leave it. Um, so one of the, one of the drawbacks is like it, it, it could actually mess with timing and don't worry, I'll draw bigger as we go on. It could actually mess with the timing of your control system. Um, but the other thing is like these mechanical parts um, are points of failure because they burn out and they short out. And then you have a room full of relays. You don't typically have feedback um, on this relay that shows that it's in good working order. And so you literally have to have a good dude go out and sort through and try to find the one that's burned. And if it's not obvious what's burnt out, you got to pull each one and test it, right? And so super expensive, to, super time consuming. And so ultimately, um, what was developed to replace this technology um, is what's called a programmable logic controller um, or a PLC. And so what a PLC is, um, is it's a little industrial grade computer um, that runs um, what's called ladder logic. And we'll get into, we'll get into what that is um, in great gory detail in the future. But basically um, you can go in and you can program relay type uh, components virtually in a, in a little computer and then you put it in an operational mode and you walk away and it simulates this kind of circuit um, in, a, in a facility. Um, and so I, we got about, yeah, we got about nine minutes left. So we're gonna get into the, the details of how all that works in, in future lectures, but right now I wanna introduce um, how we draw that kind of circuit because it can be a little bit confusing if you've never seen it before. Um, so let's say you have a power source, right? And I'm gonna, oh man. I don't know why that keeps coming up. Okay, so let's say you, you got a power source and I'm gonna draw this as a box. Sorry, I, I said I was gonna draw bigger and I'm not doing that. Get my little steady cam action going here. That's better. 
Okay. That's probably too big. Okay, so I got my power supply box. And I got my positive, and I got my negative connection points on there. So I'm gonna bring this out and I'm actually gonna connect this to um, some jumper terminals. And so all this is, is this is just a physical, uh, um, uh, it's literally just a metal bar with screw terminals on it. So you can, you can screw this wire in and then you can screw a bunch more wires into these, right? And they all have the same power supplied to them. Then I can do the same thing for my neutral. Like that. And so then I can go, I'll have a little switch and then I'll have, uh, I'm just gonna draw them as, as diodes. I'll have a diode and then I'll have a switch and then another diode and then a switch. I forgot my diode and then a switch. And I'm gonna make this look like this it's for an audible alarm. And so these are all connected in, in parallel, right? And so um, in physics class, you know, you do a lot of math figuring out if the, you know, if the voltage potential from here to here is, is whatever, 24 volts. Um, and these have X resistance, you know, this one has X, this one has Y, this one has Z resistance. Um, and these are all connected, you know, what, what voltage and what current goes through here. Um, we don't really typically worry about that, to be honest. Um, my understanding is that most industrial scale uh, power supplies will basically output whatever voltage their specs to output up to their current limit, <clears throat> up to their current limit. And so in this case, let's say our power supply is rated for 24 volt DC up to 20, 20 continuous amps, this, it's always gonna just be putting out 24 volts. Um, you don't really have to worry about um, sharing voltage between each leg of this. And it's just gonna, whatever current they need, that's what they're gonna get. Um, and so uh, that's just kind of an aside for any, any of y'all that um, are screaming at me for not uh, not covering that part from physics class. Okay, so you'll notice right here, um, I have these switches and uh, there's four switches here. Um, and so this is the part that goes into our PLC, our programmable logic controller. And so um, in one of our actual circuits, if we tie this all together from cradle to grave, so we'll have our 120 AC live from the wall going to a power supply. And then you'll have your neutral leg and then you'll show your ground like that. <clears throat> and then out of here, you'll have 24 volts DC going to terminate terminal blocks. Um, so this is your, that's your positive, that's your negative. And so then you can start connecting components. So we'll connect our PLC that has power. And then we'll connect, uh, I don't know if this is a control enclosure, you might need a fan to keep everything cool in your enclosure. And you could connect other things in here and you can continue this on and connect all your components. So this is your power distribution drawing, right? And so 
all I'm, I'm just showing my components as little boxes on this, right? And so this PLC could have hundreds and hundreds of connections on it. Um, but I don't really care about that on this specific drawing because all I'm showing is my incoming power and the power distribution. And so um, then I wanna show, uh, and so up here, that would have been like here, 120 AC coming in. Okay, so now I wanna show the actual control connections on this PLC. So this PLC is gonna have an input output card or, or multiple cards. So for this one, we're gonna draw an output. And so this card is connected to the PLC um, and it's getting powered internally from the PLC. And so um, there are cards that are called relay cards that incorporate this kind of physical um, relay inside the card, but um, commonly, it's just powered internally and your circuits are all in common. So you might have like your, your common terminal and then you'd have terminal one, two, three, four. Sorry, I swear I was gonna draw bigger. So this is your output card. You have terminals one, one, two, three, four, and your com. And so um, the way this would go is from here, go to my diode and then go to a terminal block, another diode, terminal block, another diode, terminal block, and my audible alarm, terminal block, these are all jumped together and then that goes to the com. And so this is a, this is a super common example of how you would uh, wire up an indicator light. And so um, I have an example here. Ah. So this is a, this is the wiring diagram for uh, what's referred to as a stack light. And what this looks like is this. So you have a little, you have your green, yellow, and red light. Um, I think this one just has lights. I don't think it has an audible alarm. Um, let's see if I can get this in the light. So you can see there's a, this is an M12 connector and there's little pins in there. Yeah, so there's only four pins. So this doesn't actually have an audible um, alarm. Uh, it just has the three lights. And then the fourth pin is the common. And so if you look at the instruction manuals that came with it, it it'll tell you which pin is which, because this hole is key. You can see there's a, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a, there's a key on it. So you can only insert the connector one way. And so you know which pin is which. Um, and you can wire up this part, which represents a stack light. to these specific terminals on the PLC. And then in the software, you can go in and you can program um, when each one of these is lit up to complete the circuit. Because remember inside here um, is a virtual switch or it's an actual physical relay like this, depending on what kind of uh, uh, hardware you have, what kind of card this output card is. Again, we'll get into that more later, but if you just imagine there's literally a switch in the software it closes this output point and lets current flow through the component and then back into the comp. And so um, this on its own would be another drawing in our set. So question. Yeah, go ahead. So um so like output four is like directly directly connected to the light right and then outputs one two and three those control the color of the light or like which color yeah. light goes off yeah exactly um so this is uh so output four is connected to an alarm and again sorry there's oh, no the actual alarm. yeah there's no alarm on this guy um each one of these represents a physical led 
So if this one is if this one is green, then there's a physical LED in this specific section that lights up. And I'll see some of these. Let's see if I can open this. Uh, yeah, this one may not open. I don't want to break it. Um, some of these you can actually just pop off and change the order and everything. Um, but for this one, I think it's just fixed. And so one of these pens corresponds to this green, the LED that's in this green section. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I know we covered a lot of things that you've probably never seen before and not in very high detail. Don't worry about it. We're going to get into this stuff in great gory detail down the road. Right now, I just want to cover enough um, kind of basic circuit drawing um, and circuit component fundamentals so that when you see this kind of thing, you're not completely um, confused by what it is that we're actually drawing. And again, I don't expect you to like fully understand what this means yet, but at least you can focus on drawing it and not so much worrying about like what in the heck is this crappy rectangle that this dude drew. Um, so again, um, I'm kind of changing up how this stuff is being presented, the order it's being presented, and it's a little bit accelerated because we're really jamming two quarters worth of content into one quarter. Um, but we're not covering 3D printing. Um, barely at all because we don't have access to printers right at this moment. And we are not actually building, we're not physically building the panel um, because I have the panel right here in my garage and it's pretty much done being built. So that buys us a lot of time to actually cover more theory and do a little bit more programming. Um, I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen right now. Actually, before I before I kill my screen share, did anybody have any questions about um, the drawings that we went over? Uh, what does the COM port represent in the circuit? COM port. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I kind of glossed over that. So uh, this. Okay, so one of the cool things about a lot of these cards is that it doesn't, um, this can be plus or minus. Uh, I can't uh, see can anything be, right now. Uh, oh, yeah. That's because I stopped screen sharing. <laughs> you see it now? There we are. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So um, the thing about uh, uh, DC, DC is directional right um ac you can pretty i mean don't do it and look at the look at the manufacturer specs but a lot of ac modules you could really wire up in either uh in either polarity um it doesn't they'll still function fine um but for dc the the current it's direct current and it's directional and so when i have a power supply and a positive and a negative, and I have some component over here that has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. Uh, I did that backwards. Did my computer just, ah. Uh, you got blue screened. I got blue screened, bah. There we go. Hey, and it zoomed in again. Okay, you can see better now. Okay, so then I have a component over here that has a negative terminal and a positive terminal. Well, I need to make sure I actually wire. Dude. Blue screened again. Yeah, I gotta do I gotta do a little more digging on this. I think it's for some for some reason I think it's actually re recording. It's making the GoPro record when I hit record on Zoom. I don't know why I would do that, but stranger things have happened. So I need to make sure that the polarity of this wiring is correct. Um, because otherwise, I mean, a lot of this stuff is protected, but sometimes you'll actually fry a module if you wire it up backwards. Um, and for sure it won't work. So that being said, what, what does that have to do with comp? Well, a lot of these, um, 
a lot of these modules can be wired um, in either direction, either syncing or sourcing. And so, um, uh, what, is, what does that mean? That means that this comm connection can be um, you know, I just realized I didn't really draw this correctly. So that's a really, really good, good, uh, good question. So actually, you need a power source in line here, generally speaking. Um, and so this com literally just means common. Um, and so it can be common plus or it can be common minus, uh, positive or negative, right? Um, 24 or zero volts. But what that means is this power source can be wired in either direction, right? So right here, this is negative, this is positive. But if I took this and put the negative in, if I flipped it and put the negative end on this side and the positive end on this side, this would still work. Um, and so what, uh, what decides the direction you do this is your hardware. Um, now some some stuff it doesn't matter. Um, again, some DC components it really doesn't matter what polarity it's wired in. Um, but some stuff it really matters. Um, it won't function correctly if you get it backwards. And so, long story short, that's that's why it's called COM because it's common. Um, and a lot of these can be wired either syncing or sourcing, um, which is what this. Uh, this convention means for the direction of your power source. Um, I was not. So it allows you. So okay. it allows you to connect the power source in either direction. Yeah. Or does it have to be matched up depending on which direction you want to wire it in? Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's up to you. It, it's what okay. you need. And again, not all IO cards let you do this. Um, oh. Some of them do. Some of them don't. So you got to know what type of IO card you have. Okay. Um, but yeah, you need to pick this and stick with it because uh, at least per card. Um, and a, and a matter of fact, so I think some of the cards we have have like they're they have eight uh, they have eight total I/O points, right? So this would be like five, six, seven, eight, and this would be another com. And these are independent, so you could wire this one um, syncing. Things is no, this is uh, sorry, this is sourcing. Sing, I don't know, singing or sourcing, and you could wire the other one in the opposite, right? And so these points would all be syncing, these points would all be sourcing. Okay, so I think, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that was it. Okay, I think I've done a really terrible uh, job of answering that question. It's a really important question. And I had planned to go over it later, but I wasn't fully prepared to answer that. So I will spend some time prepping for that um, and give you a much better concise explanation of all that in the future. No worries. Um, Sounds yeah. good. Because it is, it, it's super important um, in getting these things to work properly. Um, and you can lose a lot of money in ordering the wrong hardware uh, if you don't take this into account in your in your design. Um, a lot of stuff you can you can switch jumpers around and make it syncing or sourcing, but um, like a lot of the instruments, the sensors we have, they're one or the other, and they're not configurable. And so you have to do this wiring on your controller side correctly, because you're if you don't, your field instrumentation won't work.